And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to... Coming to us straight from 24 hours into the future, eh, and the creator of the of the upcoming t of the upcoming TTRPG, Driven into Darkness, the one and only Oscar. He is not elementary, but he is Oscar Watson. <laughs> How you doing today, man? I'm doing great. Apologies in advance for making a very obvious Sherlock Holmes joke, but I couldn't help myself. No, that's fine. I guess I find that all the time. I would, people always tell me that, um, oh, my dog's named Oscar, and I'm like, cool. I'm glad that's the first thing he said to me. <laughs> Why do I get the feeling a bunch of people have made the have made some sort of Oscar Mayer Wiener joke around around you, thinking that they were the height of comedy? No, it's too much of an American thing. No one ever says that down here. I only know that from The Simpsons. <laughs> yeah, well, the, yeah, well, The Simpsons is eternal, so. Yeah, but I, I, but that's like a hot dog brand, right? I, that doesn't exist <laughs> where I live. Well, hot, hot dog, lunch, hot dog, lunch meat, and all, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it hasn't transferred over here yet. No, oh. probably, probably for the be probably for the best. But um, hmm. but nope, not enough people have made have, have made elementary, my dear Watson. No, that's not actually a very common thing that people. Refer me to, yeah. No, you're pretty. You're actually pretty unique on that, to be honest. That's a that was, for me. That's a that's a that's I'm a neat. little bit disappointed in people's lack of lack of comedic skills. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but I'll start. I'll start with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Um, hey. Walk me through your introduction to role playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Um, I think a friend of mine was, uh, was trying to join the army and then they, and then they, I think they broke their hip and, um, they were, and they're always were vaguely interested in the, the potential of playing a role-playing game. And so bought all the books and made all of us play role-playing games with them. And we were very, very terrible at it. And the first one that we did play was fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons, like six years ago, I think, is when we started. Mm. And I've been playing them ever since, and slowly branching out to new games. Um, and now finally, just making my own game because um, I don't know. I, I got, a, <laughs> I have a, I have a degree <laughs> in game design, and so I just like, I'm very uh, interested in creating games and like uh building interesting systems that i can try and um create unique experiences with mm -hmm. and role playing games is just really fun something i can i can create by myself because i'm a solo solo developer on this project oh yeah creating video creating video games is usually a huge uh group effort or a solo effort taking a decade <laughs> whereas this game in particular i've only been working on for a bit less than a year. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in the in the credits for the play for the um, play tests, you listed a you listed a short handful of games that were an influence in one in one form or another, and i I'd, I'd like to delve into that as far as as far as what that ins how that inspiration carried over into um, driven into darkness. Uh, True. Um, well. To be honest, Wrath and Glory is the only one I've actually played. The other ones I've just read. I I still can, make it, it still counts. I, I make a I make a habit of trying to read as many um, uh, independent, especially independent role playing games, just to sort of see how they tackle the same issues that ever all role playing games have to do, like like how they lay everything out, like what they emphasize, what's their like key or core, like, difference, because often there's something that's, like, 
the thing that they're most proud of, and then everything else surrounding it, is the classic trappings of um, role playing games. And I find like a game like Five Torches Deep um, is a very good translation of Fifth Edition. And in some ways, my game's also somewhat of a um, Fifth Edition translation, just as a because I started a lot of the core maths started as a base from that just because it's something I'm, I was very familiar with. Mm -hmm. And um, and so is that game that does that too. Whereas Wrath and Glory, it has a lot of interesting... It's a bit of a bit of a, a too thick of a game for me, like a few too many... Um, uh, a bit too slow. But it has a lot of good ideas, interesting meta-currency stuff, and also um, a very... A very good like uh, horde combat rules or mob combat is what they call them. I'm pretty sure. And I've cr and inspired from that, I've created my own version of those sorts of rules that work in the system. Uh, Dungeon World is um, it's just a well written game, and I enjoyed reading it. <laughs> and I think it, I'm not sure exactly if there's so many things that are directly inspired from that. Um, although the philosophy of um, trying to make things as sort of minimal minimal as possible, like rolling, not overly relying on the dice and rolling only when it makes sense to roll is sort of what I got from that game. And um, Tiny Dungeon, <laughs> some, some, one I haven't played as well, but one I've just read, um, just uses a single die type, and I thought that was an interesting idea, so I tried to make this in, um, a game that only used 20-sided uh, dices. Now, to for to for <clears throat> we already we're, we are, we since we just touched on Wrath and Glory the um what a what what did you what were some of the takeaways from um your reading of Five Torches Deep? Um, my favorite part of Five Torches Deep is the way it handles um equipment and supplies. It has sort of a, um, it's not exactly the way that I've translated it into this game. Um, I made it a little bit more flexible, but in that game it works. So you have your list of equipment and if you use something, you can replenish it by spending sort of a, a currency that you have that's represented by how intelligent your character is. So a very intelligent character might have 20 points. And if they use, if your rope is lost or used, you can you can spend one of those points to have more rope. Like your character's preparedness, their um, ability to think forward and pack essential items. <laughs> and I thought that was just like such a nice um, way to smooth over that that part of the game that's either completely ignored or very nitty gritty <laughs> and punishing. <laughs> Um, and so I, I, I've, I've translated that system where uh, you have a number of points um, that, you, that you accumulate at the beginning of the adventure, and you use those to um, sort of just interact with the world in ways that aren't like directly interacting them, interacting with your skills and that. Such as like needing a ladder, needing a rope, needing a grappling hook, needing a crowbar, um, healing yourself. Um, with, with like, health potions and that, and also um, just eating provisions and drinking water and all those sorts of things. And with now with that, so the the next one obviously would be Dungeon World, which um, <laughs> is is basically what happen is basically what happens when somebody took powered by the apocalypse and says, but would it D and D? <laughs> yeah, pretty, pretty much, and, th and that's one I haven't played. So, like, I a lot of a lot of that I don't truly understand that game because I haven't played it. It's something that I've read and I think I know, but I don't um, because I haven't played it. I haven't been able to have that experience of truly like understanding the way the mechanics work. I suppose like that that game has a lot of interesting tools 
for the GM though, and I like I like making a game. I, I, at least a goal for this game was to make a game that's easy for the GM, that takes a lot of the burden away from being a GM and make it and try and make it um fun and apply lots of tool like supply lots of tools for the GM to make the the um, running of the game easier for them so they don't have to stress about it because I I do remember early on and even not that long ago playing lots of different RPGs stressing a lot about whether I'm creating a game or running it, creating a game that's fun or running it correctly, or if I'm forgetting anything that's important. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I know that feeling is a feeling that a lot of GMs feel. They feel very like the the world or the or the way that they're playing the game with their players is inadequate in some way. And um, yeah, I want to try and give them enough things to. Enough useful things that I might I would personally use. <laughs> I suppose when it comes to GM tools, um, they're in almost every game, but they're very difficult. Um, I think to because it's often the the designer is has has accumulated all these ideas and, and methods that they use to run their own personal games, and they and they and they give you the these in in the form in in the book and if it doesn't align with your with your gm style then they're not useful to you so mm-hmm. it's something that like i don't think i can truly give universally great gm tools because it's always going to be biased toward what i as a gm um prioritize so that's something that's like very difficult and is requiring lots of um Feedback from other GMs that I've that I've um, talked to who've, who've like read this or, or attempted to run it in some way. No. Oh. Um. The ne- and next would the next and the last one I have on this short list is um, Tiny Dungeon. Tiny Dungeon. Is oh, well, actually, there's more than just the dice. Um, Tiny Dungeon is a game that um, you can create characters in probably like 15 seconds if you know what you're doing, and um, and everything is just um, uh, you roll. I think a d6, uh, or you roll two d6 if you're good at it. Or you roll two d six and take the lower if you're bad at it, mm-hmm. and that's the whole game. And uh, it's whether you get like a ten, like a like an eight total, I think, or something like like an eight or a ten total. I can't remember exactly how it worked. Mm-hmm. It must be a six total. I think it's a six total. And um, and every time the characters level up, they gain a single um trait of some kind that lets them do some minor special thing like they can now reload um bows more quick more quickly they can attack twice they can uh do this sort of small thing that sort of you and you sort of build your the mechanical identity of your character as you play Mm -hmm. and um that particular idea i i ran with and and use in this game uh where in this game in particular you begin with between three to twelve experience, and every experience point you can use to to grab um, more health, increase your stats, and or, or grab a uh, ability of some kind, mm-hmm. like uh, that just allows you to do various different things, like shape change into a into a creature, or use your um, wisdom to increase your um, attack bonus against a certain type of enemy, or heal yourself in combat, or something like that. Yeah, all sorts of things. Now, one of the one of the things that that you've that you've touted with the game is what you call a player facing one roll d twenty system. Um, <laughs> yeah. Now, when, when, I th- when I think of that, one of the one of the one of the um, one of the word association um, things that comes to mind with it is the d20 system the pure d20 system that's utilized in something like say cypher 
Oh, where the where the GM never rolls, the players are the ones who roll, and it's always a single D twenty. Um, what the what approach are you taking with this whole player facing one roll D twenty? Um, well, it's there are sort of certain categories of of roles. Um, it's like a something you can do something offensive, you can do and do something defensive. Um, and I think there's spells and sustaining spells and uh, just like a general roll. So you can roll up to, I think, like five or six different checks in a single combat round if you're lots of things are happening to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, you're doing a lot of, lots of things at the same time. Uh, but generally how it works is that like if multiple enemies are attacking you, you just roll your defense once. And um, and you add whatever modifiers are necessary to that. So if it's two different effects that you have two different modifiers for, you just would add those modifiers to the same to the same result. And same with attacking. If you're attacking multiple things, you just roll once and see and add your modifier to see if you exceed their um, defensive target number. It's just um, just to keep the amount of the amount of rolls that need to be done down, especially for new players. I found this when I've like run various games for new players. They take everything very one step at a time. And if you only give them one step, then they'll do it pretty quickly. <laughs> because often when it's um they're playing a fighter or something that has three attacks, they'll roll they'll roll to attack, they'll ask you if they succeed, they'll go okay, and then they'll roll the damage. They'll say okay, and then they'll roll the next attack. And it's not their fault that they're that they're not quick at the game yet mm -hmm. but the but like it can it, su it makes the engagement around the table suffer <laughs> and I just I always want to play a game that like focuses on um, keeping everyone engaged at the same time so everyone is um, focusing on on the game and keeping the game in their head and so they don't lose the plot, lose the, the, the thread, or, or just like have, I just don't know what's happening by the time it's their turn to, to attempt to do something. Mm -hmm. And I think having a system like this helps in that way. And also um, creates really uh, sharp um, decision making when it comes to um, where you want to apply your, uh, your effort. For example, it's like, if you have abilities that make your attacks better, then you're going to always be wanting to um, to activate all of these things at, at, like almost every time you roll because because the roll is all or nothing. Mm -hmm. Now that that also brings me to the to the concept of the um, of the comeback bonus die. This um this yeah. pool, this Essentially, essentially a shared extra effort pool. Um, how did that come about? Um, I think it was a long conversation with a with a good friend of mine about about um, the benefit of having any kind of meta currency in a game. Mm -hmm. We were talking a lot about how it's it, it has upsides and downsides where. Um, a lot of the time in, in games I see you you generate your meta currency by succeeding well. Um, which I think is backwards, <laughs> in my opinion. I think and so I, I made it the opposite. You have to fail badly in order to need help in the first place. So critically failing is the only way you get these dice. Um, you can choose to add them to to anything. Um, and you can and you can also generate them outside of combat. So if you're like um, if you if you have a very bad speech or talk to someone and, and make a fool of yourself, you, you'll get one of these dice that you can use later on to kill someone faster. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make that much sense, but um, it's just more of a uh, I suppose a carrot for the players and and to just sort of um, lessen the the. The, the shame or or the um or the um the frustration of rolling critical failures um 
and also just to turn around for bad situations. Because um, I think the 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 how I've played when I when I've play tested the game personally, they often only come up maybe once or twice a session at most. Critical fails aren't that common, and only five percent chance, of course. And then so if you do critical fail much later on in the session, um, it'll the comeback dice will be remembered in a critical moment where most likely you've critical failed again, <laughs> and so you want to undo it and um, potentially not uh, take double damage and 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 die. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it pushes the um, the game is relatively like. Um, fair on both sides with the GMs where the GM controls and the player controls are very similar in strength. So this just pushes the balance slightly in the in the player's favor. Although it is an optional rule. So if you don't want to have this uh meta currency floating around, you can you can just ignore it. Mm -hmm. Now with that with that in mind, going into um going into into the character the way you have character creation set up is this is this XP based um, classless setup, and given how a lot a lot of the art and, and the like um, certainly carries the idea of a of an old school almost retro clone y um, style of ga style of um, fantasy gaming, what prompted the idea of going this particular form of XP based classlessness? Um, the main reason is that in most class-based games, I get very bored of my character after about 10 sessions, which is usually a pretty long campaign. <laughs> but um, there's a certain amount of time where I, I, I'm not, like, thrilled by the choice I made um, three months ago anymore. <laughs> Because it is usually only a single choice, unless you're playing Pathfinder, which is just, which I haven't played, but has lots and lots of choices mm -hmm. um, throughout character creation, even if you are um, playing a, a particular class. Um, and also, another thing is that I've played games where the threat that the GM is is um is posing toward us is not revealed until about midway through the game and and then all of the and all the characters aren't built to handle this threat the threat that like that targets only the weaknesses that the party has mm -hmm. and in a system like this you can have your characters um grow to to shore up their defenses against this th new threat and it wouldn't feel, in my opinion, wouldn't feel like a metagaming sense. It would just feel like the play, the characters are evolving their tactics or or just becoming more resilient to this sort of threat. And I like that narrative justification to growing your character, which I've seen the times that I have playtested this in reasonably long, um, like miniature campaigns. That's often the way that people think to to grow their character is in a is in a narrative direction. They start to think that like my character is taking on a more responsibility. I feel like I should increase my charisma, mm -hmm. or or gain a new profession as a um, as like an orator or some kind of like thing that will help me in the future. And they 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 feel like they direct the um the f the flow of their character in that way. Yeah, and I think that's it's valuable. And I suppose um it's something that like more experienced um, players like enjoy because they can create um, very unique or very specific builds um, in in the combat mechanics part that are that fill a niche that they usually can't um, fill so directly. Like the most recent um, game that I've been playing, a friend of mine is um, is creating a character that they're all about just holding the line. And not allowing any um, of the other players to get um, to get touched, they they taunt 
and they like just block areas and prevent um anyone from moving forward. And that's all they do. They they do they do nothing else. They do no damage. They just they just prevent people from moving and, and touching their friends. <laughs> and it's like it's just a fun build and they're like they're they're playing that up in their in the way that they portray the character as well. And I think it's um it's just an interesting system in that way. In my opinion. In my humble opinion. My own game. Mm-hmm. Now with that with that in mind when it comes to, when it comes to doing freeform character creation, there's always the risk of characters of um, analysis paralysis, in for lack of a better term. When it comes to cre- when it comes to creating characters, and when it comes to how, when it comes to making sure that somebody doesn't fall doesn't fall into certain traps, or or they or they're afraid that that a decision that they make now is going to bite them on the ass five um a few sessions down um how do you how do you mitigate that within the character creation setup that you have for driven into darkness i suppose i i suppose i don't um when it comes to people making mistakes I think it's a it's up to the gm i suppose whether they want um to allow characters to re respec their um their particular character Mm -hmm. i think i don't have anything written specifically about this but you bringing it up i I do i do believe that it it is an important part and it's something that i have done without really thinking about um whether i should include this in the book itself but um but no i i people (laughs) i suppose people are so somewhat free to make to make mistakes and to make um, poor choices in the way that they construct their character, and on the other end, it's very um, well. It's not a hundred percent balanced this game just yet, but um, I do have very good friends who are ex- extreme min maxes, so they always find the the very broken things and part of the game that I can um, that I can address, mm-hmm. and so it can go the other way, and I can imagine. Um, I can imagine someone constructing a character that isn't that they don't that they're not satisfied with at a certain point, and um, and then feeling disheartened that they won't that they won't have enough time to sort of like move their character in a direction that they find interesting. But yeah, I suppose it is a is a, is a GM on GM to GM basis whether they allow a char- uh, a player to to um, redefine their character in that way. Now, with with that in mi- with that in mind, um, something else something else that I'd that I'd like to go into, given ha- given how, all, given how there's a lot of the, um, D twenty system DNA in this in this thing, is how you handle uh, magic power. Um, uh, spells. Yeah, through obvious obviously through um, spells, but. Wit, but when it comes to when it comes to spe- when it comes to spell use, are you do are you doing it through a sl- a um a slots per day kind of approach the the way in the traditional method, or do you have something different that you're going to be do- that you're going to be doing to, to represent it? It's a um roll to cast, so you have to roll um for tier tier one it's um well the difficulty is 10 plus this tier of the spell Mm -hmm. so tier one to nine um but if you fail that roll um so if you you're trying to cast tier one spell and you roll a 10 or lower um the spell but um a magical mishap occurs some kind of um there's a table somewhere that like uh dictates some random event that might happen um, from very minor things like very minor cosmetic changes to your character or to like the spell completely backfiring and all those sorts of things mm-hmm. um, and once this and once that is resolved once the spell has been um, cast with a mishap um, the uh, that tier of spell is fatigued and so the character can't use it anymore mm-hmm. so the slot system, is somewhat present 
uh, but it's um, re it requires the player to roll badly. So, so the player, if as long as they continue to roll well, they won't run out of um, run out of their magic. Although every time they do cast a spell in a certain tier, the difficulty increases. So the difficulty uh, tier one will be t uh, eleven, and then twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and so on. So you become more fatigued, and until you finally mishap in some way, or you know, just stop casting the spell because you don't want a mishap to happen, and just and just leave it <laughs> yeah. until you next rest. Now, when I looked at equi when I looked at equipment in the playtest, there's one thing that I saw in there that I um I don't see often in a lot of um, old school or even even a lot of new school games, and that is a we a weapon builder system. Yeah. Um, what prompted what prompted that idea? Um. Initially, I had a, a, like a list that was just um, but it wasn't specific. It was like um, a two-handed reach weapon, a two-handed ranged weapon, a one-handed ranged weapon, a, and, and I just had this list of things, and I was like, someday I'll give them names like um, Bardiche and all that. Um, but then I looked at it again, like, uh, at a certain point, and I thought that, like, this is all just um, sort of uh, various types that are, like, either stacked on top of each other. Mm -hmm. um, and to create sort of like a, a final number. Um, since this game uses only 20-sided um, dice, your your damage is flat, so it's even easier than if it was um, some kind of manipulation of the of the die type that you were using. Mm -hmm. So then I just so then I just thought, how about it just be starts at five, and um, it increases or decreases based on the, the choices that you make. Mm -hmm. And it's as simple as that. And because it because it's flat, you just the player just says, this is my damage with this weapon, and then I'll add my stat to it. And that's all. Mm -hmm. And it's it's pretty simple. And no one, no one that I've played it with so far has had a, has had a problem with it. Um, it's not overly complicated, though I do... Um, I do have a little thing in there that says, um, you, if, you, if you want, uh, a player in a GM could work out a unique property for a weapon. Something that... Um, Something that does something very specific. Mm -hmm. If you want some kind of um, oh, like just imagine any of the crazy, <laughs> interesting weapons from from history, or just you know a weapon that's just a long um, chain and chain with a hook on the end that can yank people off horses and stuff. Like you know, because you can have. I, I have seen RPGs that have seriously, amazingly long and detailed lists of weapons. Mm -hmm. Um. But mostly, it's pretty unnecessary to have the, those sorts of things. It does add a lot of flavor, and it sort of builds the setting of the game in some ways. You sort of suggest a certain kind of um, a te technological advancement in whatever like era of um, fantasy um, medieval world that you're living in, based on the kind of weapons that exist. That was, um, and the prices of them and all that. Yeah, <laughs> so, I was... Um, I was my whole my, my whole mindset is just because we're fantasy doesn't mean we need to be, need to be medieval. So why why not go dungeon delving with a bayonet with a um, bayonet rifle? Yeah, you could do that. Like, there's nothing that there's nothing to suggest that guns don't exist other than I don't think I think I do depict them in like one piece of art, but I don't think I've actually added it to the book yet. I think. Yeah, it's um... it's not. It's this is less that's less of an issue of a piece of art and more of me working through my pet peeves with how people per perceive fantasy. I e I, yeah. I, I think a lot of people perceive um, what counts as fantasy to be very limiting. I yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> um, the nickname I've given this kind of thing is the Tolkien melting pot. You know the whole thing of it's to, it's it's trying it's trying to be it's trying to be Tolkien British fantasy, but at the same time it isn't because it does because it can't put its foot down. But it, but it totally yeah, is. I, <laughs> I, I've intentionally I've intentionally not depicted any um classic fantasy races or anything in this so far. Mm -hmm. It's just been um. 
uh, humans depicted. Yeah. Um, humans of various, um, inspired by various cultures that existed in real life. Because I, I don't really want to suggest um, the majority of the things that are suggested in, in most fantasy RPGs. The very sort of like separate and um, uh, racial lines that um, all these um, cultures are drawn around. Especially because, um, because the racial lines are often drawn on cultural lines at the same time. Cultures that are that mirror cultures in real life. And that's not really how humans <laughs> or, you know, people actually don't interact. In, that People don't interact in that way. And we and we as humans don't have a don't have an equivalent experience of that. When we meet someone from um, from Japan, they're not literally completely different. They're not like someone we couldn't have children with, <laughs> for example. <laughs> oh. It's um, it, it's a very it's a very strange um, world that the that, that Tolkien constructed. That's very um, uh, that separates people so so much like. The dwarves and humans and elves and that are very like almost alien to each other in some ways. Um, given given and I, what, I given what like... he was, I'm will I'm willing to go I'm willing to go with um what he what he was doing because in the sen in the sense of um in the sense that he was drawing on the f he was drawing on re he was drawing on regional folk tales from acro across Europe, which yeah, yeah. in that in that kind of thing. Um, el elves are going to be distinct, distinctly different from hu from humans. They're not even going to think the same way humans do. And the same thing with same thing with dwarves. Um, at the at the same t at the same time, though, when some when someone's doing their own fantasy setting that that isn't Tolkien, um, there's no reason to con to continue that unless you're doing so unless you're doing a similar kind of drawing up drawing upon mythos approach at the very least um but that's yeah. a that's a rap that's a rabbit hole to go to go down and i am not enough of a tolkien scholar to to do to do that because well um i don't go i <laughs> as har as harsh as this is going to sound i don't huff my own farts <laughs> um well i um, i suppose i just i i usually just think um if you're not going to try and make a point with including these sorts of things, then um, there's no real, they're not adding anything and they're only making sort of like, you're only just fulfilling the fantasy tropes just because they're, just because they're there to Tradition be for its own sake. Yeah. Um, but shifting past that, I want I wanted to touch on the concept of simultaneous combat rounds. Um, now for, oh yeah, right. <laughs> the the thing. Most the most unique thing that I have, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Um, would it be fair, based on the way that based on the way it's described, would it be fair of me to say that instead instead of instead of the typical individual action economy, you're operating on a phase based system? The kind of the kind. Uh, of... Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, action phase, movement phase. Uh, those are the only phases. Um, it's it's a system that isn't um, there's no true simultaneous combat in in a tabletop RPG. Um, you can't um, have the inputs all. You can't have every single player around the table roll all of their dice and start screaming at the GM all at once <laughs> to say say this is happening. This is happening. Um, so what you what, what you do is you just put a lot of the trust. You, the GM has to put a lot of trust in the players, and the players uh, a lot of trust in the GM. Mm -hmm. And um, how it works is that, like, the GM says what's going to happen, um, saying, like, this thing is going to attack you, you need a 12 to defend against it, and it's going to deal 14 damage to you. Mm -hmm. And then, and then that, that player's like, okay, um, I'm going to attack it, and they're like, okay, you'll need a 14 to hit it. And then they just move on to the next player, and that player can resolve that, by themselves, and then and then and then just give the the, the GM the pertinent information. Often, at, at a certain point in the combat, the players might even know that this that the attack that they can do will kill it, since their damage is flat. The if they killed it last round, they're going to kill it this round as well. Mm -hmm. So often, it's a lot of um, 
it's sharing the <laughs> sharing the load, I suppose, the the mental overhead, and allowing the players to um, control a lot of the a lot of the experience by the GM giving giving trust to them. Mm-hmm. And um, and in that way, it also keeps everyone engaged because um, the GM says this is all going to happen. All these guys are going to attack you. This guy's going to attack you. This guy's going to attack you. And then everyone's in the moment and 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 moving through and resolving it all. And no one's really waiting for, uh, waiting to to act or or second guessing themselves when it comes to like, um, okay, this has happened now. Okay, this has happened now. Okay, this has happened now. And then it comes around to their turn, and their four plans that they've come up with have all just been snuffed <laughs> by the time it comes around to their turn, and they don't really know what to do anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, instead, they're working as a team and um, trying to. Combine their efforts together, all in the same in the same moment. Yeah, there's a lot of nitty gritty stuff to do with that, though. Like, mm-hmm. because everything is considered si- simultaneous. Um, there's a lot of situations where, um, like a like a player and an enemy can both hit each other at the same time and kill each other at the same time, <laughs> and just be both dead. <laughs> like that can happen. Like stuff like that can happen, which is sort oh. of the um the sim- the simultaneous death is a well worn cliche in samurai films. Um, exactly, so, yeah, and it, and it, and it can't truly really happen in most RPGs. <laughs> uh, no, and no, and in a lot of in a lot of cases, you might have one person goes down, but the, but the, the person who went down was a load bearing villain. I.e., they i.e. they had a bomb that would activate when they died. <laughs> hmm, yeah, um, true. I, I suppose it's also, um, it's also a system that. Oh, sorry, I oh got I lost my train of thought. Mm-hmm. I just completely forgot what I was going to say. That you, you, you said something. Yeah. Um, it, it, I lost it. Shifting back into spell casting for a bit, given the fact that you um, you had cut your teeth for for a bit on D and D fifth edition. Um, mm-hmm. you're prob you're probably familiar with the concentration rule that it has, which um. A lot of people, myself included, have been very have been very critical of, and when it comes and the question that I have is when it comes to sustaining spells, is it a case where you have to you you have to utilize an action in order to to sustain spells, or do you have a different method? Uh, you can sustain as many things as you want, but it's more difficult the more things you attempt to sustain. So, so is it on the is it in the same umbrella as the? Um, escalating TN t- for uh, spell casting. Uh, e- no, it's a penalty dice thing. Uh, well, there's a there's a system that's um basically advantage disadvantage, but mm-hmm. it can stack um as as many times as as, as it needs to. Akin so to, if you're um again to boons and banes in Shadow of the Demon Lord. Um, I haven't read that one yet, but yes, <laughs> I suppose. Um. But yes, it's um. So if you're sustaining uh, two spells at once, you'll you'll uh, sustain with a penalty. Mm-hmm. And if you're sustaining three spells at once, you'll sustain um, with two penalties. Uh, there are ways to negate the penalties as well. If you have any bonus dice, um, which are, act, act like advantage, they will negate the um the penalties. So you can sort of move it more toward a median. Um. So yeah, there is yeah there is, a, I suppose a penalty to sustaining multiple spells at once, but it is possible. Yeah. And if if, you, if your character is very mentally strong, very um a very good spellcaster, they can sustain multiple spells quite easily. Yeah, so th- so there's not going to be that whole issue of like I, I remember I remember playing wizard in in five e and how getting getting a haste as soon as you can was almost mandatory because other because otherwise you'd be spending more time um um sustain um sustaining spells with concentration you wouldn't be able to do much else yeah yeah like i i want spellcasters to be doing magic the whole time just about until they explode i suppose um <laughs> but um Give, given the oh, yeah, it's... given the setup that oh, you have sorry. with um character creation, 
Um, is is it re is it relatively possible, and have you seen it in playtesting, for characters to do a bit of gishing? Uh, very, yeah. It's um actually quite easy to become a spell, um, martial spell hybrid, mm -hmm. since it it costs only a single experience point out of your starting twelve to be a martial character, one one that can get access to martial traits, mm -hmm. and and you can you can dip into spell casting with only one experience as well. You can just gain a first tier spell um, for one experience, or you could gain multiple first tier spells, or a first tier spell and a few second tier spells, and this will just only cost you um, a small amount of experience. Or you can um, gain access to the um, magic sort of magic power growth, spellcaster growth sort of system mm -hmm. uh, with three experience at the beginning. So, you know, a heavily armored um, magic user uh, only costs you uh, six of your um, <laughs> six of your starting experience. So only half of your level one, basically, mm -hmm. um, to become like a, um, a heavy armored uh, martial character that uh, can cast two first tier spells. And then from then on, you'll every level you every level you increase. You can increase your can continue to increase your tiers, mm -hmm. and um, been casting second tier spells and third tier spells, and fourth tier spells, and the, there are lots of spells I've added to sort of encourage this sort of um, playstyle. Things that are things that like are specific to not specific to melee characters, but um, emboldens certain melee characters and. Um, all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. mm. But yeah, it's very easy to be very easy to be a gish. It's uh, just as easy to be a gish as it is to be anything else, really. Mm -hmm. And of, co of course, of course, even even if somebody doesn't with or with the choice of um of the way tra of the way traits work, I don't think you're gonna have the basic fighter issue or bab or um Babby's first class. No, not really. I, I suppose like um, there are some traits that are just like very, very simple um, that are just um, increase your uh, chance to hit by sacrificing your movement and things like that. Stuff that's easy to understand. Mm -hmm. um, traits that don't require much um, mental <laughs> effort to remember that you that you have. But yeah, there is no real basic character build, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I might add at some point a section that like details a, a standard build of a certain kind, but I'm not sure if I really want to encourage new players to just be a standard like character, if you know what I mean. I sort of want them to because they, they will only begin with so much experience and they'll only be able to expand their character's options to a certain level, and then they'll be drip-fed experience every session, like maybe just one, um, one or two experience each session. Mm -hmm. And they'll, and I want them to think about what they want to embody, like what they actually want to be, <laughs> like what traits make the make sense for their character, or what stats they want to increase to to best reflect what they want their character to be good at. Right, I, I, and I can make sense of that. Um, yeah. I do find the visual design of the quick play and, the, and ostensibly the um, what the what the core book will probably look like if the quick play is any indication to be very interesting. What with this, what with this very almost magazine, almost magazine like approach that I've I have that the only equivalent that I've seen when it comes to putting this much em emphasis on the on a visual style is. Ah, uh, Mork Borg. Um, what what inspired you to take that particular route for the for um, just the way the just the way the pages are laid out? It was probably Mork Borg. <laughs> I have read that. <laughs> that was a very easy read. That one. Um, well, the rule book was uh, originally just one page for that thing. The rule book. Yeah. yeah, it's mostly just setting stuff, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, although this is like 
or no setting and only rules. So it's sort of the opposite, I suppose. Um, but no, I'm just um, I'm just an, generally I'm an artist. I'm not like a professional artist, but I've always been doing art my whole life, and I just find it fun and interesting. And when I read a lot of um, RPG books, um, I find it very difficult to navigate them. Um, Often they're very long, like they're over 100 pages or something. But also, all, almost all of the pages look the same. the the one the main The main one actually is uh, Dungeon World. I find I have it's terribly every page is is like just a block of text on a wide page, and you know, there's like 500 or 300 and something pages or, or whatever. So I don't expect them to have art on every page, but and, and it's not a reasonable expectation at all, but it's it's very difficult for me to find what I'm looking for just by flipping through the book. Mm-hmm. And I sort of wanted a book that where where almost every page had a unique something unique on it, or a unique border, or at least like a color that that different that gave it a purpose. So I sort of am going for green, meaning martially. Mm-hmm. Um, related things pink is magically magic related things and gold is things that relate to any character and then there's other things like red is just like bad stuff like enemies and death and um and then certain other things like uh just orange being sort of like a general sort of color as well mm-hmm. um but yeah I, I just have fun i just have fun making it like this so i am it's and it it's one. It's something where, when it comes to designing um, the books, like the content of the book, I I come up with my best ideas when I'm just um, when I'm creating art. <laughs> so so it's sort of like a meditative um, um, process that allows me to think through the decisions that I've made and um, and iterate on the mechanics that I have is by like creating art for the for the book. And so I, I used to always. But even before making this, just make art for no reason other than just the joy of creating it. Mm-hmm. Um, but now I just um, now it has a more of a purpose. So whenever I make something, I end up adding it to the book, and it's always in that it's always made in a con in context with the book. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Now, with that with that in mind, um, what are you shooting for as far as the total page count for the book? Um, I think it's going to be around 50 to 60. Um, since I have plans to to expand the pages that detail the traits and the spells. Currently, those pages are very dense um, and difficult to, to navigate. Mm-hmm. They um, Everything's just all, uh, alphabetically ordered, even though some things have pre- are prerequisites of each other and they're nowhere near each other. And it's and it's um and they're some they're placeholder pages at, at this point. I'm currently creating um, little sort of I suppose um, uh, token little mini little token images that represent all of the traits, um, so that like. They can all have a little visual indicator, um, and give them all more space, and the and thus like expanding the pages that the traits and spells take up by a, mm-hmm. probably double or triple. So there's going to be a lot more um, pages in the center there, where the the traits and spells are later on. Mm-hmm. Um, but other than that, I think I think none of the other pages are really going to be expanded. There might be a few spots where I where I um, make a one-page thing, a two-page spread instead, just to give it a bit more room to breathe. Because mm-hmm. there's a few other pages where the text is just a little bit too cramped, um, especially because I've added more, or more as my the ideas that I have become become bigger and need more text space, and then my original um, layout of the page is, it becomes inadequate. I need I need to edit it. Uh, but yeah, it's um. It's a process. But yeah, around 60 pages also. Maybe a bit less, maybe a bit more. All right, I, I gotcha. And what are you shooting for as far as a release window? I think it's very 
difficult, but I think based on how on where I where what I've gotten up to at this point, I think I'll be done and this will be like available in its full uh version perhaps like next February, I think. Mm-hmm. That's just that's a hope though. I'm not I'm 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 very unsure. I I can't I, I can't. It's hard to measure how how quickly I'm 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 developing this because there's some days where I just sit down and do maths all day to try and figure out how <laughs> if if some certain aspect of the game is um is overperforming or underperforming, and then there are some days where I um I complete the art for a whole page in a single day, or it takes me a whole week to complete the art of a single page, based on how complicated it ended up ends up being. So my, my my work speed is, I, I, don't know, I suppose inconsistent, but it's just it's just me. So I can get burnt out sometimes. And I have to I have to, I have to uh, binge watch a TV show for a day just so I don't um, <laughs> become depressed <laughs> mm. or something. Mm. And. I'll so I will certainly be keeping a close eye on how, on how it develops because I because while I'm pretty sure some people will play things straight with their builds, I want I want to see the dumb builds. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's something where um, when it comes to like the traits and spells and that, um, well, with the traits, m- majority of them are combat oriented because. Because the role playing aspect of, of role playing games, I find the less rules related to that, the easier it is to adjudicate role playing. Mm-hmm. And so I've sort of relegated the skill skill system to just um, whether your character has a profession in in that area or if it relates to the origin of that character. Which... So the, when you when you create a character, you choose a profession. And you choose your origin, mm-hmm. and when when you're making a role on something, you can just pitch the GM. Oh, does my does my profession relate to this? And they can give you a bonus, and um, or does my or, the origin of my character relate to this? And they can give you a bonus, yeah. and um, that's basically the whole skill system. It's just <laughs> yeah. it's just like a single word in your character sheet, and um, but yeah. I know that I, I know that I'd probably be step I'd probably be stepping on the to- the toes of some D and D adherents, but D and D, regardless of edition, has never done has never done well with a skill system compared to other games because it was never designed for one. Is that true? I, that's I do that's, find that's my, that's always been my assessment because when when I, when I say designed for one, I'm I'm think. Consider how, say, Wrath and Glory is designed with is designed with a skill system. Um, Shadowrun is designed with a skill system in mind. Um, but D and D, but D and D, the there were the thief skills per se. But in terms of, in terms of a intrinsic universal skill system, it didn't really ha- it didn't really have that for the longest time. And when it when it when it when it was brought in, especially when it's brought in with um third edition, it's been this awkward thing where that where it's never really fit. Feels more like a limitation than it does a, a benefit. Yeah, if if I can you if if I had to use a video game example of this kind of thing, um, it'd be why why so many um so many Halo players don't like Sprint. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know what you mean. Ah, oh, I remember that. Mm-hmm. Halo Reach. <laughs> oh. Lar- largely because the go- in Halo, the golden triangle has always been um, guns, grenades, melee. Hmm. But Sprint has never really, and everything has been tightly des- was tightly de- designed around that from day one. But Sprint was never in the conversation for that in de- during. During the early, during the early days, so when it gets so when it gets put in, it doesn't it feels um awkward or it does or it's the odd man it's the odd man out the third wheel whichever you'd like to call it. 
And I remember a lot of the extra abilities they added in like in Halo Reach were very um, problematic to the way the game felt. Oh, they were. Um, and and broke the game in especially the armor lock one completely broke <laughs> broke the game. Armor lock, it, drop sh drop shield, sprint to a degree, jet packs to a, to an even to an even bigger degree. Um, especially because it because it was a classic arena shooter where it was all item based. So I'd say um yeah. Although mm. I'd say I'd say that there were a couple other things that were bigger culprits for break for breaking one of them being um the being switch being switching descoping to flinching which which meant that it was harder to do reversals and mm, the, mm, uh, the, yeah that wasn't good <laughs> the uh, the other th the other thing was um the DMR which on its own is not a bad rifle it's not a bad weapon, but when you put when you put it in how the maps are designed, um, it's a, it's way too powerful. Mm, yeah, it was the uh, optimal choice. I always just tried to use the assault rifle just to um, try and win with a weapon that everyone didn't like, just because I was the, I'm the kind of I'm that kind of person who Which... likes choosing the underpowered option to just um, feel to give us some love. <laughs> Well, that that and you can rub it in someone's face, like like saying you got your you got your ass kicked by someone shoot using a pistol. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, but okay, bad example given the original, but you get my point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the pistol is just the most um, uh, just the most all over the place gun in, in that series, though. Mm -hmm. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on to the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Yeah, it's it's, it's been lovely. And, and any, I enjoyed talking. Anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!